Hi, everybody. It's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Thank you for being with me today. As you know, the month of January, I am talking about investing all month long. I feel, as you know, we've discussed on this show, that if you want to move the needle, capitalism is the way to do it. If you're waiting for governments, you're going to be waiting a very long time. We can indeed Put our dollars in alignment with our values and our voices, and that's when you'll really see change happen. No one has done this like my guest today. I'm going to read his list of accomplishments, but I must say that I'm deeply grateful for all that he does. Jeremy Collar is with me today. I want to bring him on. Jeremy, thank you for being with me. Thank you. Okay, so let's just, before before we get into it, and we will, let's just list all of your accomplishments, shall we? You are the godfather of secondaries and private equity. You are known for having the preeminent food technology portfolio. But really what we're talking about today is that you are the founder and chair of FAIR, Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return Initiative. This initiative, FAIR, is really what puts dollars behind change, potentially. I want to talk about this on your your day job, if we will. Uh, at Collar Capital, you manage $25 billion. But under your network at FAIR, we're going to talk about how the network functions, you are in charge of, that's probably not, not the right expression, you'll, you'll correct me there, of $47 trillion. Now, folks, if you want to move the needle for people, the planet, and animals, it's $47 trillion trillion dollars that's going to do it. So Jeremy, let me start with you today. What exactly is FAIR and why did you start it? So FAIR Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return, of, so thank you for having me, by the way, is um, an investor network of just over $47 trillion. It's the fastest growing ESG network in the world, um, which is great. It has giants like Fidelity, HSBC, um, Calsters, so it's about it's its members are fat from family offices to the largest pension plans in the world, etc., and sovereign wealth funds. But what we what Fair is doing is um, bridging the knowledge gap for investors. So it does a lot of research, and and then investors decide whether they want to engage or not. And so so we the research on on through through an ESG lens. I mean, it might be worth explaining the ES environmental social governance lens briefly. And, um, you know, today, uh, sweeping the world is a lens called environmental social and governance. And, and that means that pension plans are saying, um, What's the point of having a pension in 2050 if it's too hot to be outside? Of course. They're saying if we're going to build a textile factory somewhere, we need to have make sure there are fire exits and foundations. Not, I've got to say, e through ESG lens, not because we care about the workers necessarily, but because it's good business. Mm -hmm. It is good business to have a strong ESG. It's like when I was an oil analyst, we used to look at the health and safety record of, of an oil company because it told you something about the quality of the management. And you look through that lens and you can see all sorts of different things. So, for instance, we looked through when we started this organization in 2015, we came up with um, 28 ESG risks and opportunities. And those risks ranged from 80% um, of antibiotics in the US are used on factory farms. You know, we know now, you, could, you know, we all know people or have heard about people who are, are, are not being able to cure sepsis or, or pneumonia, et cetera, because the antibiotics aren't working. Um, you, there's diabetes, there's um, cancer, et cetera. This is a long answer. <laughs> is that okay? No, no, it, it's a great answer. I just want to um, kind of bring it home for people. So what Jeremy's saying is that when management doesn't pay attention 
to the environmental impacts of their business, to the social impact of their business, to the social governance of their business? Are they um, diversified in terms of their employees? Do they have things like foundations and fire exits? So that's something we'd all like to see, obviously. If they're not doing this kind of management structure, they're not running a good business. And so one as an investor wants to make sure that they're looking through this ESG lens to make sure that their investments are protected. Now, a lot of people listening today are thinking, well, investments, but I'm also caring about people, the planet and animals. And, and this is, for me, the the important thing that FAIR does is it bridges that gap for people. Not always were people caring about people, the planet and animals. They were caring about investments first and foremost, and I don't begrudge them for this because I do think it is our use of capital aligned with our voices that does move the needle. So I don't begrudge them for, for caring as I do, by the way, about my investments or their investments. I just want them aligned to do the most good possible. And that's, that's money and that's also change. So um, as you talk about ESG under this network, I want to talk about what a network is because people probably aren't used to thinking about um, it this way. You're not actually managing the 47 trillion, but of this network, I'll say maybe even membership, if I have that right. Yeah, it's a membership. Membership. So those people who are concerned with these issues and realize it's good business to focus on ESG, their cumulative wealth together that they're potentially putting towards this is $47 trillion. Now, and this is why I'm deeply grateful for the work that you do. You're a very wealthy man. You're very busy. You don't have to shine the light on ESG. And if you do shine the light on ESG, you don't have to focus on farm animals. And you have. Can you tell us why you've decided to put together this enormous database? We'll talk about just how deep your research is for farm animals. Um, what, 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 you want my personal motivation? Yes. You don't have to do this. Oh. You're a very wealthy, very busy man. You don't have to do this. I became a vegetarian at 12. And I was very proud of myself. You know, I'm a bystander. I'm a. I was a bystander. You know, I didn't. Um, yeah. I didn't wear leather. I didn't eat animal products, etc. And then about um, eight years ago, a friend of mine said, "Can I write your obituary?" And I said, "What the hell are you talking about?" And um, and I said, "Okay, well, I want to live as long as no one else sees it. You can write it." <laughs> but, uh, and he said, "And I, I said, I want to live happy to a hundred. And he had purpose, love, health, and gratitude as um, the four. The f I had, I put that as my four ingredients. And he wrote the obituary. Um, we actually went skiing together, and he said, "You die tomorrow," which is not great on a ski, ski, ski. No, a little bit of a bad like omen there. <laughs> and he said, "He said, Jeremy, uh, you're you've created an industry. You know, the Godfather of private equity secondaries, and and you're very rich, and you're a total bore." Yeah, I know. I, I was like, oh, thanks. And um, Andy we might disagree. The <laughs> no, and then and then and then he said, I've written another one. You don't live to 100. You live to 98. And um, and you're, you're amazing. And he put down that I uh, changed pension policy oh. in Africa. I have a passion for pensions and, um, and that I have a business school named after me, which I do now. And um, and uh, and that uh, and my business becomes great. So I'm sitting there. I'm 98 years old on my deathbed, and I think to myself honestly, to myself, if I could save a few cows from a concentration camp, I'd be authentically much happier, mm -hmm. even if everyone laughed at it. And so, so he, you know, he wrote down, and I'm, you know, he wrote down, and it, uh, you know, I just laughed at what he wrote down. He said. You know, I, I end factory farming and I thought, you know, just how does any individual make any change at all? And, and then I had an epiphany uh, about six months late, you know, it so soaks in. And, um, and um, basically um, I thought, well, you know, I don't really want to pick it outside a university or, 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 you know, so what, you know, what are the cards I've been dealt with in my life? Well, I'm a chief investment officer and, and actually, you know, I suddenly realized ESG, which I'd taken for granted, I'd paid lip service to up till then, ESG can change the world. And so what we did is 
we did these 28 ESG risks. Like, take the example of antibiotics. 80% of antibiotics in the US are used on factory farms. So mm -hmm. the first and the first um, engagement we did was with 20 restaurant chains like McDonald's and Burger King. You know, we went with 4.7 trillion dollars, 78 investors, and we engaged with them not not as an NGO, but as owners of these businesses. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why it's antibiotics in the, is a risk. There could be regulations. Now, in the US, Jerry Brown, the governor of California five years ago or so, last year enacted that it banned the everyday use of antibiotics in California. And you've got all sorts of issues now and the farming, but they have been enacted. That is an investment risk. There could be a class action against restaurants. That's an investment risk. So we want to mitigate these investment risks. It's about materiality, not morality. And so to mitigate, we engaged with these 20 restaurant chains in um, April 2016. One out of 20 restaurant chains had any sort of antibiotics policy. Uh -huh. By the end of 2018, because we own these groups, 20 out of 20 had antibiotics policy. Many of them, um, many of them now uh, have a date when they end the everyday use of antibiotics throughout the whole food supply chain for their restaurant supply chain. You know, so McDonald's and Burger King and KFC you know, have all, are all got, at least they look, what gets measured gets managed, obviously. That's yeah, so, an example, but there's plenty more. So again, just to bring this home for people, what Jeremy's saying is that by having this network, this group of members, and they have 47 trillion at the moment of, of money that they're investing in these companies, so they actually own them. This is how you move the needle. You look at the data and you say, well, you are an investment risk to me because you're putting antibiotics into all of your burgers. I won't, won't name one chain in specifically, but all of your burgers. And now the McDonald's, public, Burger King, et cetera. I mean, do they, it, Jeremy. They can be named because they all have policies now. And and so and and this is the point. Jeremy has gotten them to have policies such that antibiotics will no longer be used in this food, which is better for us, of course, um, as a society across the globe, because there's so much antibiotic resistance because we have so much antibiotics in our food. It is indeed everywhere because it is indeed with all factory farmed animals. And let's be realistic, folks. Despite the happy cow that you see on some commercial, to feed. The world of almost 8 billion people at this point, we're looking at 80, give or take around 80 billion farm animals a year slaughtered. So it is factory farm meat that's on your table. For 7.8 billion humans. Thank you. The numbers man sets me straight. Um, yes. So we're first of all, I just want people to understand the scale of what we're talking about. 7.8 humans, almost 7.8 billion humans, almost 80 billion animals. I've seen 77. I've seen 81. Yeah. Um, so just the scale of that, sit with that, and then know that there's no um, humane certificate that's going to be able to, to feed the world with those kind of numbers. Well, let's translate that into investment risk, etc. Please. You know, so, so, so in terms of, I mean, and these are statistics now well known. They weren't six years ago when we started, but 91% of Amazonian deforestation is a result of livestock production because 85% of soya is used uh, for feed. 85% of soya, you know, and um, uh, in terms of climate, there's so much uh, methane and uh, greenhouse gases produced. You can't get below the Paris two degree limit unless you deal with agriculture. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, um, in terms of water, you know, the, you know, your fresh water. I mean, in California, worrying about a shower when, when, okay, besides the almonds, etc. You know, livestock production. <clears throat> you know, with we're 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 giving fresh water to eighty billion animals. The waste, 
that's being produced is is um is i mean there's some amazing statistics on waste but anyway we'll leave that for another time so what he's saying is, and, and you can understand this when you understand the numbers, 80 billion animals, less than 8 billion people. So you're looking at 10 times more animals on the planet every year. So you can see the sort of land and water that would require, I'll just, since I'm with a numbers man, I'll also spit out some numbers. Life cycle analysis from Beyond Meat using 99% less water, 93% less land, 90% less green, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and 40% less energy um, according to the FAO, and this continues to be updated, I've seen that livestock produce 14.5% uh, of all the global emissions. And the Wall Street Journal recently did a study that says up and down the supply chain, so you imagine that you transport these animals, they're quite heavy, much heavy, often it's done live, just it's another conversation, but you know, obviously much heavier than grain. You know, if you go up and down the supply chain of, of how much um, energy and greenhouse gas emissions are um, created because of the livestock industry in general, not just from the animals, they say that 36% of all greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to animals. So the, the point is you have to feed the world without destroying it. And if the animals are taking all of the land and all of the water and all of the food, we haven't even talked about food security, but you know, soy has protein, it has fiber, you know, other grains do as well. Do we give that protein and fiber to people? No, we give it to animals and they give us back, you know, one seventh, if it's a chicken, the calorie conversion of grain um, to actual meat coming from a chicken, you'd get one seventh, you get about one twenty fifth from a cow. The point is- But it is delicious. Oh, you think so? You've been a vegetarian well, since you were 12. Yeah, I know, but everyone, but that's what people love their chicken and their burgers and their steaks, et cetera, don't they? They, they do, but I will say, you know, we're just chatting here off the cuff, but, you know, when people ask me, oh, is this a fad? You know, this is just a bunch of, you know, people with a, a sign on a street corner, a, a vegetarian, you know, who's got a mission. I actually say no. Um, yes, there are people on the street corner with a sign. I love them, by the way. Thank you for doing that. Then you have this group of flexitarians, people who've heard from their doctor over the years, cut out red meat, come on, pull it back. You know, they're looking at their health. Now, Innova Market Research and the Good Food Institute says that planetary health is as important as personal health. So, you know, the numbers we were talking about for land and water are starting to register with people. That's important too. those people who are interested in personal and planetary health, together with the folks with signs, that makes a decent group. But that's not what's going to make this permanent. What's permanent is what we're talking about today. It's the business equation that is completely inefficient with the resources that we have on the planet. So we're going from 7.8 billion people on the planet to about 9.8 billion by 2050, according to the UN. But you're not getting more land and you're not getting more water. And industry knows that. So that's my really my next question for you is, you at FAIR, well, we could talk for a long time, uh, you at FAIR are putting out all this research on things like antibiotics, for example, or land and water use, another example. Are these major protein producers, the ones that you've already mentioned on the show, others being you know Tyson and JBS, you know, the major protein producers, you guys, that you know of, are they reacting to this data? What what has the impact been of your work, please? Um, well, first of all, we, you know we're looking at all the major uh, meat and uh, animal producers. So we have thirty two thousand data points. Gosh, um, in looking at issues that haven't been measured. It's the only one that measures in terms of climate in terms of water, in terms of waste, in terms of antibiotic use. And, and so I've, I've mentioned the success we've had with antibiotics. Um, it's a journey, you know, there's still, it's a journey. <clears throat> but, but as, you know, money is power, as you know, mm. capital is power. Mm -hmm. All 20 restaurant chains um, have, have, uh, have now an antibiotics policy, et cetera. In terms of alternative proteins, we engaged with uh, supermarket chains on climate, uh, like Kroger, or Walmart, and Tesco, and Sainsbury, as owners, as the pension. By the way, the owners are not 
groups like Fidelity, the real owners are you, the citizens, all of us are the owners. Our money is aggregated through Fidelity, et cetera, or family offices, whatever it is. Um, but it's it's our money, it's, you know, and, and our money is now engaging um, as as responsible invest sustainable sustainable profits but with, with things like climate so we engaged with Kroger and Walmart etc and Tesco and Sainsbury and said to get below the Paris two degrees limit you've got to put more plant protein on the meat aisle um, and and the reason for doing that you know again it comes down to investment risk there could be regulations. There could be a carbon meat tax. Mm -hmm. There could be class actions. You know, so there, there are real investment risks and the supermarkets are listening. And as we all know, the percentage change that of seeing uh, Beyond Meat and, Memf and um, Impossible, et cetera, on the meat aisles is growing. And no longer is, uh, is the milk the the, the non-dairy milk on a separate aisle on the vegan aisle, it's on the, actually that was, you know, um, it was my big suggestion to Beyond Meat that they only sell it on the, uh, on the meat aisle. Um, and, and sales went through the roof because people, why would you choose a meat burger when you can have something that tastes exactly the same? Um, so that's, but that's been very successful. You've got, you've got, um, um, you've got, and in terms of uh, climate, all six fast food chains engaged. We only we only engaged with six, like McDonald's and KFC, have committed to a science-based target for climate. Oh, that's the toughest gold standard for emissions reductions. So you know, th there's still a long way to go. I'm confident we're going to win, though. And, and you just have to look at what's happened in the dairy industry. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, um, plant-based milk was 1% of sales in 2010. Uh, today, it's over 15% of sales. Result? Recently, in 2020, you know, um, Borden Dairy and Dean Foods, two of the biggest, biggest U.S. dairy farms, filed for bankruptcy as demand for their cow's milk plummeted. That's success. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, but I, that's a question I wanted to ask you. So I am happy to hear that you think we will win. What does winning mean to you? Maybe define that in a number sense, if you could. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we can't win fast enough. Yes, right. Um, so, so, you know, there is no celebration. There is no, you know, because, um, you know, we should be ashamed what we're doing to other animals. Uh, in the factory farming this has got nothing by the way um you know one of the big myths that we were able to puncture was it has nothing to do with vegetarianism oh you know, this is yeah. about investment yeah. risk yeah and mm -hmm. you can be against having antibiotics in your food supply chain and eat meat it's not so so just that but you know in terms of climate the sector is moving you know, obviously not fast enough. 20% of our index firms have now met, um, have now, 20% have now net zero targets, up from 7% just in 2020. So the sector is moving. Um, methane, sorry, methane yes. is a huge issue. Oh, sorry, come on. No, no, I, I, I'll, I'll ask my question when you're, please go ahead. Now, I just wanted to say about methane. You know, methane is a big problem. 82% of the firms in the index, 82% don't even track their methane emissions, let alone have plans to reduce them. By contrast, Beyond Meat generates 90% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than a beef burger. But, 
you know, I'm, and I'm, I, I so agree with you about politicians. I was at COP26 and, you know, just looking at the numbers again, methane, fossil fuels are 30% of all, they, they have a, they've come up with a target to reduce, to reduce uh, methane by 30%, okay? They only talked about fossil fuels, but fossil fuels are at 30% of all methane. 40% comes from agriculture. Yeah. You cannot deal with methane unless you deal with agriculture. But you had politicians, even though they know that you have to deal with agriculture, they've got vested interests in, in um, they've got terrible vested interests. So, yeah, but capital, capital is changing the world faster than politicians. Politicians actually get in the way. Um, and if you want real change, you're going to have to do that with, $47 trillion that you're directing or, or you, that you're, you know, you own these companies and you have a part of them and you can direct them towards change. Um, it's very frustrating to go to something like COP26 and see them offer, see them put forth the numbers in their own right, see them offer on the menu a broccoli salad that has, you know, 0.2 emissions and then a chicken burger that has, you know, 3.9 emissions. You're doing the numbers right in front of everybody and not acknowledging animal agriculture and the deleterious effects it has on the planet. I think what we're saying here, folks, is you will not address climate change until you address agriculture. It is simple as that. And if you don't address agriculture, you're wasting our time. And we don't have time to waste. It's actually another resource that, that I talk about on the show. We're talking about land. We're talking about water, healthcare costs. Um, we'll get into that in just a second. It's time. If who's you know if you're doing a family office with legacy investing you know the importance of time in your investment and you know you've got kids and grandkids to think about so the time on the planet is limited if we don't get our act together and that is bettering our business equation that business equation affects healthcare costs as well and as you see um these foods adding to colorectal cancer heart disease and diabetes and you look at the numbers and what that means for our bills, our healthcare cost bills, but also for the quality of life, which does have a, a number attached to it, if you will. You know, you want your life to go as long and as happy as, as possible. I am curious why we don't have a class action lawsuit. Now, I didn't give this question to you in advance, so we might punt it for another interview. But if you have a thought on that, I'd love to know. Oh, it's very simple. Um, uh, sorry. One thing you didn't mention, if you Google C A L F dot law, calf dot law. That, that law. is a new initiative um, to uh, accelerate law and policy across the world. Oh. So that po an interested policymaker in one country who perhaps doesn't have the resources can take the laws from another country and plagiarize them. Google it. Oh, I will. There's so fair.org. So so calf.law is going to create is is and there's a collar at Colin Menon Animal Law Center at Tel Aviv University. There's Cambridge University's got animal law. So these are going to be creating class actions, etc. So well, I'm, so, I'm waiting so for one, it. on one side you've got you've got creating the investment risk. On the other side, you've got the investors that need to mitigate. Right, which is why your data at FAIR, Farm Animal Investment Risk yeah. and Return Initiative, is so important .org. because you're .org, yes. And you can see that scrolling down at the bottom of our screen, folks, F-A-I-R-R.org. It's a Getting play on this, internal rate of return as well. As only a numbers man would, would say. Um, Getting this data to people is so critically important so that the investors know, because up until FAIR, I'm not really sure that they did know. Um, well, so it's in encouraging to hear that there might be a class action lawsuit. I think of it sort of like tobacco. Ultimately, that did end in uh, lots of lawsuits because of the impact of tobacco and the selling of tobacco to people. So it's interesting to hear. Um, you'd mentioned a lot of law firms. I also, excuse me, of law schools. I think of Yale that has a department, and I think of North. Western that has a, a yeah. department for animal law. So, so um, I will wait for those. Now we're talking about guiding that investment um, to enact change with 
major meat producers, ultimately meat and dairy producers. That's what we're talking about. How do the plant-based or fermented proteins or cultivated meat, they're so small in comparison, how do they move the needle or is it, are they really too small yet to have a major impact? Um, well, Beyond Meat's and Impossible have broken through. I mean, Beyond Meat's in every, you know, it's moving into every KFC at the moment. And um, and they're in McDonald's, Impossible. In, you know, it makes veganuary very easy to do for those that want to do it. So it's, it's a journey. I think everyone is starting to cut down on their consumption because there is, as I said, you can't have a revolution with a carrot. Now, yeah. when you said, is it a fad? You know, in a way, and I'm one of the largest investors in it, I hope it is a fad because you talk about for farmers needing a just transition, which you really need for farmers. You know, they need help and advice to transition from factory farming to, to plant-based, to, mm -hmm. to growing um, proteins like peas and soya, et cetera. There needs, to be, there needs to be a just transition for them. But... I've, I've just come up with a funny idea, which which I don't mean as in any other sense. But, you know, I see the food tech as a just transition for meat eaters in a way. So I meat do eaters as well. Need to, you know, I mean, if you've been a vegetarian, you know, it's great. I love eating Beyond Meat burgers, but really I've moved on to lentils. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you've progressed. It's, no, I, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> It, you know, so so I do. You know, is it a fad? No, but but <clears throat> um, it's 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 a trans. It's a, I do think it's a, a large. I hope it's a transition because you know it. Yeah. Anyway, but can we talk about waste for, for a moment? Sure, absolutely. Talk In about waste. In terms of the investment the... risk, please. I mean, excrement is. Um, yes. You know, I don't think we fully know how toxic. We, we, we are, you know, and let, let's just talk a little bit about how huge it is. So, you know, just one for Smithfield facility in Utah, just one facility, half a million pigs, oh my God. generates more fecal matter than all the inhabitants of Manhattan. You take one company, Tyson, just one company, Tyson, um, produces alone produces more excrement than the entire US population. Just one company, Tyson. Now, you know, we're seeing that go into our, 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 our um, water supply. We're seeing that go into our land. You know, um, it's, 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 it's um, frightening actually. I want to to um, underscore what you're saying and help people understand this. That's why in the beginning of this interview, we were talking about the scale. I'm not quite sure people understand. They see a commercial, they see one cow. That's that's not what it's like. It's 10 times more animals on the planet than humans. All those animals, of course, go to the bathroom. And as I understand it, Jeremy, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that waste is not treated. So it's not like they're going to the bathroom in a toilet and it's funneled out. And I'm not sure the regulatory process such that this is even allowed. But my understanding, Jeremy, is that that waste just flows right into land and water. Uh, so. so if you Google manure lagoon, you know, when, when I was growing up, I always thought of, um, you know, a cow pat, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But cow patty. Yeah. A cow pat. But. But now, because cows are given hormones, because cows eat grass, I, I know that's amazing that we should even say it, but cows eat grass naturally, and we're giving them grain, which they can't right. digest properly. We're giving them hormone treatments so they can digest it. I mean, that's why they will have so much methane, etc. cetera. And, um, but the, the, the sh that's coming out of them is, is not normal. It's diarrhea all the time. Oh my god, my god! It's not, it's not normal, you know. And you can imagine if you're given the wrong foods all the time, and ho you need hormone treatment to digest it. 
Yeah. Why would you eat it? Why, why would you eat it? And I, I think of, you know, again, just hearing you say it, there's obviously the animal welfare issues that we're both, you know, concerned about, but what a bad business equation. Like exactly. what a ridiculous business equation to feed them something that they can't eat. They usually just get their protein from grass, like, like, you know, many, because uh, protein is in vegetables. But instead, we're feeding them grains. This grains makes them sick. So then we have give them drugs, and then we take in the drugs. And then their conversion of the calories in the grains is a poor conversion. You know, for cows, we say it's 25 to 35. Let's just go with 25 calories in to get one calorie out. You're an investor. Is that what you want? You want to give someone $2.50 to get back a dime? You won't be an investor very long. What a bad business equation. Just like, you know, I, I say, I used to think cultivated meat was the death of animal agriculture. So cultivated meat, folks, we've talked about it a lot on this show. You take some cells uh, from an animal, usually from a database, doesn't even have to be from a live animal, and you're growing them in um, a media with usually sugars and, and other things to, to grow this meat outside of the animal. And then you can grow enormous quantities. You're not using land. You're not using water, very much diminished land and water. Um, you don't have the uh, justice issues, if you will. Think about who can afford a filet mignon. But if we're doing it in, in a lab scenario, then everyone can have filet mignon. So, you know, just lots of benefits here, a very resource smart, if you will. Um, I no longer think that cultivated meat is the death of animal agriculture. I think it is the natural progression. So if you think about uh, this, the phone, and it used to be attached to the wall, the cell phone isn't the death of talking on the phone. You still talk on the phone, but now you have something called a cell phone. And I, I see that that this is just the natural progression. Technology is taking us to a point where eating meat will actually make business sense, make, make technological sense. I don't know if I you mean, have a thought on that. In the 21st century, you know, when you, we've moved, in the 20th century, we've moved from um, We've moved, we've got email, we, you know, we just have, we fly everything. But how crazy is it that you would get your milk from, you would you brew your milk in the breast of a cow when Perfect Day, and, uh, which is a food tech company, fermentation company, uh, can brew exactly the same milk, exactly the same milk in a brewery. A hundred percent. I love their ice cream. I, I eat it all the time. It's now in my Mariano's in Chicago. So you can just go right yeah. and get it in the, the but it is frozen real. Section. It's, it's not, it's not oats. It's not soya. It's, it's not almond. It's real milk. It's yeah. real milk. It's got casein and all the other things in it's using bacteria to re recombinant, which by fermentation, etc. It's real milk. Yeah. And it's so so efficient to create. The taste is there. There's no sacrifice. So if you have that choice, something that tastes the exact same because it actually is the product and it's made so much more humanely and efficiently, why would you ever choose anything else? This is why I say it's the natural progression that we're just making a better product. Um, who among us would invest in the typewriter? Jeremy, is there any, any app, any in, improvement to the typewriter that would make you invest in the typewriter? Well, I've said that about watches, but uh, people still buy watches. Well, I think it's this way for animal agriculture. You just at some point you'll say like, well, that's ridiculous. Why would I ever yeah. raise animals in this way? Very crazy. I'll, I'll say that at VegTech Invest, everybody knows here, we, we're really focused, whereas you're focusing on the meat producers and getting them to, to switch and pay more attention to ESG and, and be a better investment opportunity um, by being smarter and, and hopefully the results is, you know, better for animals, the people on the planet. We're really focusing on these um, businesses that are innovating with plants and that can even be the media that is supplying the fermented. We're on a, we, history is on our side. Oh my gosh, people yes. People are investing. You know, we were talking before, before this interview about your interests, et cetera. You've launched a very successful ETF for for food okay. tech investing. Um, it's it's you know the, the the history is on our side. Yes, the history yeah. is is on our side. My only concern is, will we change it fast enough? Um, do you think we'll see change in uh, we our can't lifetime? Change it fast enough? Oh yes, yeah. you do. Yes, in, it's in my obituary. 
<laughs> that's right. Oh, that, oh, I just that. have to link. I have to live long enough. <laughs> okay, well, then you can't go anywhere because we are dependent upon you and all that you Not, do. No, 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 no. I'm t- I mean, you know, he wrote that to inspire me to do something. And he did. What a, what a gift he has given what all of us, actually, not just to you, but all of us. Um, as we wrap up our interview today, because I know your time is short, and thank you for spending it with us, and thank you for all that you do. I'd like to ask you, um, since we're talking about you do think there will be change in our lifetime, so we're going to say under 40 years, uh, what are your predictions in the short term, let's say three to five years? Oh, Um I have to think about that one. Okay. I'm going to let you think about that one. And I'm going to ask you a couple other sort of personal off the cuff questions. Um, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Um, well, I wish I'd, I, well, I did start. I had the idea 10 years ago, for, no, uh, eight years ago. For, I'm so ashamed of what we do to other animals. I'm, and I think, we should be shamed on the factory farming nothing to do with vegetarianism nothing to do you know um you know i i'm i'm for, you know eat less and better meat um but what would i do differently um i i wish i'd been even bolder you know this is um yeah I, I, mean, I, I wish I would. You, uh, so, my my whole company. Um, um, I, in September, I did something which I felt was very courageous, because um, because I I've been meaning to do it for fifteen years and I've been too scared. But in September, the company refused to buy any. The company gives we give lunch to all the staff, etc. But uh, but we refuse to it's a vegan that if people want to buy their own meat at dairy we won't we won't do that and um yeah and i wish i'd done that earlier i, I it took a long time to pluck up the courage to do that and if i may say because there's a lot of family investors watching that 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 do back events etc um we we always do now conditional giving if we if if we sponsor um a if we sponsor a uh, an event, a, a, din- a gala dinner or something, it's, what we do is do the 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule is at least 80%, for us to give money to for a gala dinner, however little, um, at least 80% has to be plant-based and the other 20% has to be free range. It can't, no factory farmed food. So uh, what we call conditional giving, which is, um, if I may give that a little plug as well. What we're saying here, folks, is make your dollars count. And you do not need $47 trillion to make your dollars count. You make your dollars count every time you go to the grocery store and you purchase. So you align your values with your dollars and you will see change. And I'm so grateful for all the change that Jeremy has enacted. And I love that 80-20 rule along with um, all the work that you do. But that's just icing on the vegan cake, if you will. Um, as we wrap up, I would love to know, uh, is there a phrase that you say to get yourself back in the groove? Um, I, I, if, I, if you Google, I'll leave you with this. If you Google um, time travel to a meaningful life, time travel to a meaningful life, that's my little story about the obituary. And what I wrote at the end of that was um, to enjoy the journey, which I keep forgetting to do. I love that. I love those words. And thank you for leaving us with with that. I always say nose to the grindstone, eyes to the sky. We all have work to do. We've talked about it here today. It's not just Jeremy, folks, even though he is guiding that 47 trillion. It is all of us together. We must do that. I want to thank the godfather of secondaries and private equity, the man who has the most preeminent portfolio in food tech. He is the managing partner of over 25 billion at Jeremy excuse me, at Collar Capital. But really what we're talking about today is he's the founder and chair of Farm Animal Investment 
risk and return initiative. That's the fair.org initiative, F-A-I-R-R.org. Everyone go and look at the tremendous amount of data and research that is there that is meant to guide the major protein makers, basically the meat makers, that's what we're talking about, meat and dairy, uh, to better um, guidelines for animals, people, the planet through their ESG lens. Very, very meaningful can work. Can I just give a, can I give a, a chapeau, a hat off to the food companies? Yes. They're embracing this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're investing in a meat company that's that you're engaging with and it's chain and it's listening because it wants sustainable profits you know tyson is now a protein producer not a meat producer it's it's strapline it's you know, meaningful so change it's meaningful change and and we're you know they're, they're, you know it's really exciting that every, you know every, a lot of people a lot of companies investors and citizens are all buying into it Yes, it's going to take a village. So it starts with Jeremy and the work that he does, no. but it is up to all of us. So um, I note that here. Jeremy, thank you for your time today. Thank you for all that you do. Please don't go anywhere. Everybody else watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter, I will see you next week.